uh, HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www dot survey monkey dot com forward slash lowercase r forward slash all uppercase letters and some numbers s w p as in pam three j b as in victory seven caroline i will put the link in the chat for you here it is again it's https colon forward slash forward slash www.surveymonkey.com forward slash lowercase r forward slash all uppercase letters s w p is in pam three j v is in victory seven that is the evaluation remember it's password protected we'll give out the password at about 1250 uh, and uh, until then, just know that we are accredited by both boards, the Board of Nursing and the Board of Social Work to provide this hour. And we very much hope that you will participate through discussion. Each of you has the opportunity to unmute your mic and ask Bill questions, which I'm sure he would love to field. I'm sure he's seen everything, but he may not have seen what you have to ask him about. So we hope you will uh, do so, and if you're not confident uh, using the microphone or are not clear on how to do it, please use the chat room and ask questions. I will uh, read those to Bill and see his answers, but we do hope you participate. It's so much more fun, and we gain so much more when you add your voice to ours, and we look forward to hearing from you today. I will now cede the floor to Bill Nolan of the Alabama Elder Law Firm, and he will enlighten us on what is estate planning. Thanks, Sean. <clears throat> um, I appreciate that very generous intro. Um, I will say this, that Lynn Campisi has been plugging away in elder law in Birmingham. Uh, uh, for many, many years. So I certainly would not personally be claiming to be the, the, the forerunner. Uh, Lynn's been doing this quite a while herself. And I'm sure many of you already know her. She's excellent at what she does. Um, so we're going to talk about estate planning. There we go. The term seems very specific to me, but I, I can't tell you how many people are confused by the term estate planning. So my goal today is to raise awareness among the attendees about what we mean when we call it estate planning and, and who might benefit. You know, it may be your own family. It may be your clients or patients, or it might even be you yourself. So I hope you do get some benefit out of it. Some people think that only wealthy people need estate planning. It's not true. And some people think that only old people need estate planning. And that's not true either. In fact, the uh, people who need estate planning the most where it's most critical would be young parents. When you have uh, minor children, people don't think about that. And, and yet uh, that's where it really makes a difference. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, so we're gonna talk about five major areas uh, of focus um, about what constitutes estate planning. Uh, one is how to protect you if you get sick or you're disabled. Uh, who's gonna step into that role? Uh, another uh, might be who's going to distribute your assets after your death and, and who will receive those assets. And that's probably what most people think of when they think of estate planning. The third area is how can you take care of your minor children if something were to happen to you and your spouse? Uh, the fourth, I think, would be avoiding probate. Is there a reason why you would want to avoid probate? What are the benefits? Why would you want to worry about that anyway? And the last is protecting the respective children in second or third or fourth or fifth marriages, uh, which is an area that many people just don't think about. So we're going to dive right into there. Please feel free to ask any questions. Uh, we'll, we'll answer them uh, either when Sean sees the question posted or I see it posted. The first uh, document, um, and it focuses on how to take care of you if you're disabled or you're sick. The first uh, document you really need is a power of attorney. Powers of attorney are financial in nature. 
Uh, they don't really do anything about your health care necessarily, and they terminate at your death. So they don't help. They don't do anything with your estate. But their focus is to help you manage your financial affairs while you're alive, but unable to do it yourself. And it could be temporary. You know, you've broken your leg, you're in the hospital, or it could be permanent. You're in a nursing home with dementia. It could be short term or it could be for years. Uh, what you're doing as the principal, the person who is signing the power of attorney, is you're appointing what's called an agent, a person to, to work for you, to do your bidding, whether it's writing checks, making deposits, opening and closing the safety deposit box, dealing with the taxing authorities, dealing with Medicare, Medicaid, the VA, Social Security, um, uh, uh, perhaps even um, uh, allowing you to... Uh, appointing somebody to make business decisions for you if you can't make them yourself. You are granting people very specific powers in most powers of attorney, and you control uh, those powers. So um, it, it's a very important document. I'll say this, why it's so important. It's even important between spouses. And the reason is, in a married couple, you might refer to a 401k as our 401k, or an IRA as our IRA technically that IRA or that 401k belongs to whoever's name is on it. You can only have one name on it. So if it's your husband, it's his 401k. Now you might benefit from it when he's gone, when he's dead, but until he's dead, you could, you don't have any say so over that power of attorney at all. Same goes for you. If you have the IRA in your name, your husband has no say so, which may be a good thing. But if you went to the nursing home, it would be nice if you could use your own 401k or your own IRA to pay for your care there and your the spouse at home, the community spouse, wouldn't, wouldn't be able to unless you had a power of attorney. So if you don't trust your spouse, and I'm not making any judgments uh, about that at all, you can appoint someone else over your 401k or power of attorney, a parent, sibling, to uh, be able to transfer that money out if uh, something were to happen to you and you couldn't take care of it yourself. Uh, as I said, a power of attorney could be broad. You could say whatever powers are necessary, or it could be specific. You could have one as specific as I'm granting the authority to my brother to sell my house if I'm uh, uh, out of town when the contract comes in and the house is ready to close, for example. Uh, it could be to sell a car or to get uh, a title renewed on a car, tag renewed. They're always revocable. Um, you can revoke it anytime you want to. If you don't have a reason to trust somebody, you can revoke it. It always terminates at your death. Um, and um, there's something called a durable power of attorney. I don't know if you've heard that term thrown around. Before 2013, a power of attorney had to state durable power of attorney on the face or it wasn't considered durable. Durability was the characteristic that allowed a power of attorney to continue operating even after the principal had declined to a point where they couldn't make decisions for themselves any longer. For example, dementia or a stroke. In the olden days, before 2013, if you had a power of attorney that was not durable and the principal developed dementia, well, the agent, according to the law back then, could never have more authority than the principal had. So if the, if the principal lost their legal capacity, the agent lost theirs too. Well, that seems kind of pointless when you think about it. I mean, the only time you really need a power of attorney is when the principal doesn't have the ability to manage their affairs themselves. So it was like having an umbrella that dissolved on the first uh, uh, drop of rain. So they changed the law. And the law since 2013 is that all powers of attorney are durable without having to state that unless the power of attorney says otherwise. It would have to say this power of attorney is not durable and I've never seen one say that. So durable power of attorney is a term that's really no longer in use, just so you know. Um, the um, next set of documents, I think, to take care of you, remember, while you're unable to take care of yourself, are the healthcare related documents. Well, Bill, uh, I, have a, I have a question, uh, which is maybe a dumb question, but on the prior screen, um, you said all powers of attorney are revocable. But how does one revoke their power of attorney? Does that also need to go through court? Good question. Um, no, it doesn't. You, you can notify your agent that you're no longer happy with the way they're managing you know, your affairs, 
and their authority is now revoked. A better way to do it is to notify your agent in writing and record that revocation at the county courthouse. So there's a time and a date stamp on it. Um, once the agent is aware of your revocation, they no longer have any authority to act. And if they do, you're acting in uh, outside of their authority and they could be prosecuted for that. So I, how does it record it? Do you go to the probate court or do you go to the city hall? What do you? Sure, you go to the probate court, just like you would record a deed or a, uh, anything. Um, you just walk up, get in line and say, I'd like to record this. And, and they'll quote you a price and you'll $5 or something like that. They'll scan it, give it back to you and it'll have a stamp on it. Recorded, book so-and-so, page so-and-so, Jefferson County Courthouse. Great, thank you. It's easy to do. Um, the uh, healthcare documents here in Alabama go by the name, the Advanced or Alabama Advanced Directive for Healthcare. And that's a combination document. That's a, a combination of the old living will document and the appointment of your healthcare proxy or healthcare agent. So it's, it's combined into one longer document collectively called the Alabama Advanced Directive for Healthcare. It's a document that the medical community and the legal community kind of get together on about every 10 years and, and um, uh, craft and, and uh, as you know, situation changes in the law and in medicine. And we're really due for a, an update. That document's going on 10 years now. Uh, what it does is it allows you to tell the world. If two doctors say, I'm not gonna make it, I'm at death's door, I'm not gonna get well, but they can keep me alive a little longer with artificial life-sustaining measures, I do or do not want to be kept alive that way. Simple decision. You're making it though. The beauty is you if you make it in your healthcare document, you are not asking a loved one to make it for you. And that's a real gift because no matter who you're asking to make that decision, they're always going to second guess did they make the right decision. That is, if they said no, put her on life support, well, was that the right decision? Or take her off life support, was that the right decision? If you make it, all you're asking someone to do is to follow your instructions. You're not asking them to guess about what you might want. It's a real gift to your loved ones to make that decision because nobody wants to make that decision. Let's face it. Um, it it's, um, it's just, you know, it's hard to make. I, I grant you that, but it, it's, it's uh, easier for you to make that decision than for maybe your 22 year old child who has to make it for you. Bill, I can I can attest to that. My uh, mother-in-law, when she passed, was on hospice and had no uh, advanced directive. And so my my wife and her sisters sort of had to just guess. And forever now, for every year, they have some remorse about, quote, killing their mother, you know, by by doing this. Yeah. which uh, was, was the right thing to do. They all agree, but nonetheless, that, you know, that's their sense because it was their decision, I think. Yeah, yeah. So you really are doing your loved ones a favor by making that decision for them. Um, at least in my book, it's a true gift. Um, in addition to the Alabama Advanced Directive for Healthcare, we have our clients execute a HIPAA waiver, uh, which is a document that says, I understand that my medical condition, my treatment options, my diagnosis is confidential and nobody has a right to know what they are. I understand that, but I'm nevertheless giving the hospital, my doctors, my nurses, my pharmacy, my therapist, whatever, permission to discuss my condition with the following people. And then you can have the kids, sisters, brothers, parents, whatever you want. That does not give people decision-making authority. It merely gives them access to information. And any of you who work with HIPAA understand how serious institutions like hospitals take HIPAA. They've been sued for millions of dollars for, for being too loosey-goosey with people's medical records. And uh, now they, you know, they'd rather err on the side of caution and, and not give your own child access to your medical condition, which is unfortunate. So a HIPAA waiver allows you to decide who gets to know what's going on with you if you can't make those decisions, uh, can't speak for yourself, in other words. Does a power of attorney do the same thing or no? Power of attorney is financial in nature. It's, it's designed to help you manage your financial affairs, but it really has 
very little. Uh, now we do put in our powers of attorney a limited HIPAA provision to give your agent authority to know what's going on with you medically, but it doesn't cover the gamut that this would. Okay, so this is essentially the medical power of attorney. Yep. This, this, it, that's a good way to put it. It's a medical power of attorney. It's making okay. somebody uh, under the proxy. It's giving that person the same authority that is to make decisions for you if you can't speak for yourself. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, we also do what's called a dementia directive. And it only, it's fairly new, I'd say year two. Uh, so I haven't seen any cases come out of it yet, but the dementia directive basically says that if I am in an institution because I have dementia and my dementia is at uh, stage six or seven, which is by many considered the terminal end. And if um, I am no longer interested in eating my food willingly, I do not want to be force fed. I don't want to be fed against my will. Now, when you think about it, if you're in a memory care facility and you've lost your interest in eating, their job is to keep you alive. They're gonna feed you in whatever way they can, whenever they need to. Family members will see their loved one being force fed and it upsets them, understandably so. But the facility's job is to keep you alive. So what this document does is it does two things. It lets your loved ones know hey, if, if I'm at stage six or seven and I've lost my interest in eating, I don't want to go on like that. I don't want to be kept alive any longer than necessary. And it lets the facility off the hook from having to force feed you because you've expressed what your desires are. So it's a great, a great document to have. Uh, it only applies to dementia, though. It doesn't apply to, uh, to any other uh, uh, health condition. Um, we tell our clients to take their advanced directive, their dementia directive, and their HIPAA waiver. And we give them a, a, an extra copy of those after they've been signed, stamped, notarized, everything. And we tell them to take it and give it to their MD, their regular doctor, as soon as possible and have it scanned into their chart. The reason is we want that document to be available if something happens to our client um, uh, as quickly as possible. So if you're if you've done that, let's say that you've taken our advice and you've given it to your doctor, it's been scanned into your chart, just like your blood work and your prescriptions and all that. And now you're on the way to the beach and you have an accident in Flomaton, Alabama, out in the middle of nowhere. I hope nobody hears from Flomaton. And they take you to the ER, wherever that is in Flomaton. And you're unconscious. Well, they're going to dig through your purse or your wallet to find your Blue Cross card because, first of all, they want to make sure you can pay the bill. And second, they want to contact your regular doctor to get your chart. Uh, so they're going to uh, type it in, boom, up comes all of your info, and, and they call your MD and say, we've got one of your patients in here, email us her chart stat. Well, the doctor's office would email it over because the, the facility you're in, the ER doesn't want to do more damage than, than has already been done. You know, if you're on Coumadin, you have a plate in your head, you're uh, uh, maybe uh, prone to seizures, uh, uh, might have AIDS, uh, who knows? They don't want to risk doing more damage than, than has already been done. So they want to see your chart. They want to know something about you before they get more aggressive. And in that chart, wow, an advanced directive for healthcare. This is who we need to call. We need to call her daughter. We need to call her son or her husband and let them know she's in the ER here in Flomaton. Otherwise, how in the world are they going to contact anybody? How, how are your loved ones going to find out where you are if you don't show up to the beach house or whatever, wherever you're heading? That's why it's so important to do that. Another thing that I see, a mistake I see on a lot of healthcare documents people have brought in here for review is they'll have their loved ones listed as their proxy, you know, their daughter, their son, their, their mother, father, but they don't give a number. They don't give any way to contact that person. Well, what good is it if the doctor doesn't know how to contact your loved one if you're in the hospital. I mean, it's no good at all. And another mistake I see is the document clearly says you have to initial your choices in about a dozen places. Initial next to the choice you make. People will invariably put a check mark there on their choice. Well, how is the world supposed to know that was you who put that check mark there. It has to be your initials. Otherwise, it's not valid. And I guess another relative, uh, um, related one is the document has to be witnessed by two people. And a lot of people will just sign it and not get it witnessed. 
and it's no good. So there's certain ways that it has to be acknowledged and executed, and, and many people either are oblivious to that or they, uh, they just think it'll work just as well as it should, and it won't. Um, the uh, um, advanced directive will give someone else medical decision making, and the HIPAA waiver gives people access to information. That's all. So that's how the healthcare works. And 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 I want to go back to the will, the uh, power of attorney for a second. I have the power of attorney in the healthcare at the beginning. People think of wills as synonymous with estate planning, but let's face it. You can be disabled, you can be sick several times over the course of your life. You might be in the hospital for a month, you might be in a nursing home for you know a year, you might be, you might be recovering from a stroke. And those things can happen, you know, multiple times. So you'll need a power of attorney and a healthcare directive multiple times over the course of your life. But you'll only need a will once. And a will doesn't do you any good at all. What a will does is it takes care of your stuff. It doesn't help you because it only goes into effect after your death. So that's why I think a power of attorney and healthcare documents are more important because they take care of you while you're alive and unable to take care of yourself. So that's my that's why I put them higher up. One last thing to remember about healthcare documents is when people move to Alabama, uh, they'll often bring their documents from another state, Virginia, Tennessee, Georgia, Florida, whatever. Healthcare documents are very specific to each state. They, they all do the same thing. They take care of, of medical direct, you know, they, they help someone when they can't take care of themselves, but they go about it so differently from state to state that a hospital in Alabama might not be accustomed to looking at a Virginia healthcare directive. They're gonna send it up to legal before they let somebody make decisions for you. That could be a week. Well, it would be so much easier just to execute new ones in Alabama than to hope that your Virginia healthcare directive will be honored and recognized in Alabama. Now let's dig into the last will and testament or trust. When a person dies, their assets are distributed either through a trust-based plan or a will-based plan. Will-based plans are probably more common. You know, they're, uh, everybody sort of understands what a will is, is designed to do. I mean, a will distributes your stuff after you're gone, right? And a will might appoint somebody to take care of your, the process, an executor or a personal representative. They manage the process of distributing your assets at death. That's pretty much the extent most people think a will is designed to accomplish. I have met these old timers, and I'm sure you know the guys I'm talking about. These guys can do everything. You know, They can change the engine in their truck. They can put a new roof on the house. They can do a room addition on the house. They can you know, they, they, they work, they, they do everything themselves. They have a workshop that rivals some commercial operation. You know, they have every tool known to man. Their assumption is they don't need anybody's help to, to, to take care of their stuff when they, they're gone. They can just write it out. Well, they don't understand that that's not all that a will is designed to accomplish. And they create problems because they didn't, they were either too proud or maybe they don't know what they didn't know. They didn't know to call a lawyer. Then you run into the cheapskates, the ones who say something like, I don't need no lawyer, I'm quoting a client, I don't need no lawyer to put on paper what everybody knows they're going to get when I die anyway. Well, you know, unfortunately, a will does much more than just distribute your stuff when you're gone. Uh, but those, those kind of people we really like to see because those are the ones we can really make money on. Uh, will litigation is much more lucrative than drafting a will might be. Now, there are two, uh, I guess, two options when a person dies. Uh, one is, did they die with a will? The other option is, did they die without a will? Dying with a will, they call it testate in Alabama. Dying without a will is called intestate. Um, a, when you die with a will, you have saved your family months and months of time and hundreds, if not thousands of dollars of cost because a will although it doesn't avoid probate entirely, it's a fast track through the probate process. You don't have to go to the judge and ask permission to do every single thing. You don't have to post a bond. You don't have to jump through a lot of hoops. When a person dies without a will, though, that nobody knows who should be the right person to manage the distribution of assets. 
So the judge has to appoint an administrator. It may or may not be who you wanted. Nobody really knows who gets your stuff. So the judge relies on what Alabama law says in terms of who gets what. Um, and it may not be who you wanted to get what. Also, some people, they might want to give to their church or some other charity at death. Well, you can't do that if you don't have a will. If you have a will, you can make a charitable bequest in your will. I give, you know, $10,000 to First Baptist Church or whatever. Um, but uh, without a will, no more charity. Uh, incidentally, you cannot disinherit a spouse entirely. Even if you can't stand your spouse, you, if you put in your will, I'm not leaving one red cent to my spouse, your spouse is still going to walk away with roughly 50% of the assets in your estate. The kids would get the other 50%, whether you have a will or not. So now you can disinherit children, but you can't disinherit a spouse, just so you know. Um, another thing that people don't think about is in the movies and in novels, they oftentimes have what they call a reading of the will. That is where everybody, you know, sort of uh, congregates at the lawyer's office and they sit around a big table and the lawyer unseals this will, unfolds it or unrolls it and, and reads the will to everybody so that they learn what they're going to get. Well, I've done this 40 years, and I have never once in Alabama heard of any lawyer doing a reading of the will. It works great in novels and movies. It's very dramatic, but it doesn't happen. So if you have someone who, who dies, don't expect there to be a reading of the will. That's not the way it works anymore. Okay. Bill, did you catch Miss Va uh, Vaughn's question? She asked, no. uh, should you also have a trust along with a will to avoid probate court? That's a great question. I, I, I appreciate you asking it. There are two kinds of trust. Um, there's what's called a revocable living trust, and there's what's called a testamentary trust. Now, a revocable living trust is, is um, a trust that truly avoids probate. It goes into effect when you sign it, while you're alive, and it stays in force until some date way down the road when it terminates. It might be the the uh, uh, your children getting to be a certain age, for example. A testamentary trust, on the other hand, is a provision in a will. And it, it, it's used a lot of times when you have minor children, where you might say, if my spouse and I are both gone, I leave, we, we leave everything to the Smith family testamentary trust so that our children will be provided for uh, and they'll get their money at certain times down the road. A testamentary trust only goes into effect when your will is probated, though. So a testamentary trust doesn't avoid probate at all. It's designed not to avoid probate. Um, so it, it's really, we don't use testamentary trust unless there's some very specific reason why one's necessary. We would prefer to go with revocable living trust. Another reason why a testamentary trust is maybe not a good idea is if um, upon your death, someone gets to your will first and they're reading it you know people are nosy and they see this trust set up in the will um and they don't get their money until they're 35 well if that will just magically disappeared they're going to get their money when they turn 19. so you know there's some incentive for people under testamentary trust to maybe make wills disappear when they don't need to with a revocable living trust, it's already in a for, in, in full force and effect, and they can't make that disappear. I hope that answered your question. So a will doesn't avoid probate. It's a fast track through the process. It's supervised by the judge, but not interfered with by anybody else. It does require uh, your creditors to be given notice. So if you die and you owe Visa and MasterCard and Ford, Ford Motor Credit and the, the mortgage company on your house money, you have to notify them and they can file what's called a verified claim against your estate and they would get paid before any of the family gets paid. So, but you have to notify these creditors by law. And a will of course can be challenged. Unlike a reading of the will, which is a, a literary device that's rarely used, a will challenge is oftentimes used. And that's where a, a beneficiary or somebody who thinks they should have been a beneficiary claims the will is invalid for some reason and wants the court to throw it out. So 
uh, that's a weakness of a will because you you open a probate case as a case number and everybody knows it's out there. People can look at your will if they want to in the court record. It's a public record. Uh, and if they don't like it, they can challenge it. And then you get into all the legal expense and delay associated with that. Um, a trust, on the other hand, uh, is not um, uh, subject to a challenge like that. A trust is 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 much quicker, much faster, and uh, avoids uh, some of those problems that a will uh, might have. Um, so uh, some of the benefits to using a will-based plan, or well, really a, a trust-based plan for that matter, is it can provide for minor children after your death. If you and your wife have an act, you and your husband have an accident, you're both gone and you have minor children, uh, they don't have a clue about anything, about what, how, what you think about them, how you want them to be raised, who gets to raise them, uh, how the money should be used. And minor children will get all of their inheritance the moment they turn 19. But with a, with a testamentary trust in your will or with a revocable living trust, you can say, I want my uh, children to receive uh, anything they might need for health, education, maintenance, and support while they're minors. And if they go to college, we'll pay for college for them. They'll get the first third of their inheritance when they turn 25, the second third when they turn 30, and the final at 35. That way you hope they're older and more mature when they get their hands on their inheritance than when they were 19, which I guarantee you they would be. You can also appoint guardians in a will-based plan or trust-based plan. And uh, uh, that would be naming someone or a, a, a maybe a succession of someones to raise your kids for you until they're no longer minors. That provision saves so much conflict between great grandparents, because let's face it, if you and your husband are in an accident together, your parents are probably the ones who are going to say, well, naturally, we're the best people to raise the grandkids. I mean, who else would there be? Well, your husband's parents might think the same thing. And who's right? Well, nobody knows because you didn't put it on paper. So now a battle ensues, as they say, between the grandparents. Your parents are fighting his, par his parents over who should be the guardian. And whoever wins after spending all that money and time, I guarantee you they will not let the other set of grandparents have much interaction with the grandkids because now you've developed all this animosity with the other set of grandparents. So you can avoid that animosity by naming a guardian. It, and, and that way everybody knows who you want to be guardian. It's so simple and yet it's something that people just don't think about. Uh, Mr. Uh, Teresa Carpenter has a question, Bill. Yeah. It's uh, does the lawyer keep a copy of the will in his possession to avoid problems if the will is destroyed or lost? That's a great question. Um, we keep a copy. It's a scanned copy, so it's you know signed, witness, notarized. We send an electronic version to the client, so they have an electronic version, and we give them the original version. The, the original is the one that would have to be probated unless it could not be found. And you can use a copy to open probate, but the assumption if the original will can't be found is that it was destroyed by the client. So you have to overcome that um, deficiency. And the way we would do it is we would say, well, um, I was his attorney and uh, he never once came to me to ask how to revoke his will or to change his will. And uh, I, I would be the first person he would have come to if he wanted to do that. And the fact that he didn't suggest to me that the copy of this will accurately reflects his true intentions. Uh, it's, it's not the best way to go through probate, but it's at least a way to go through probate. Um, in some states, which I think it's a much better setup, they have what's called a, a registry of wills. And in those states, the lawyer keeps the original will. When the lawyer learns of the death of the client, he or she would take that will and give it to the registry of wills so it's scanned into the official court records. And then probate would occur at some time after that. So there's much more of a, a safeguard in place that the will would not be destroyed by someone or lost by someone that way. But Alabama, you know, in our infinite wisdom, we don't do it that way. I uh, wish we did. Um, so mentioned revocable living trust. I'm a big fan of revocable living trust. I know 
you know, a lot of lawyers in town are too, they avoid probate. Why would you do that? Because it saves at least a year of time. It saves thousands of dollars and it's not getting any easier in the probate courts. And Sorry to interrupt, Bill. Yeah. Another, another, another question or a thought, I guess. Gail Thrasher says, I always thought that people filed wills with their county. Wills aren't recorded until a person dies and then they're recorded in probate court. A will is always revocable. You can change it, mend it, revoke it, do whatever you want to at any time, as long as you have capacity. If you were to record a will in a court and uh, later change that will, there's some confusion over which one was he relying on, you know, the, the one he recorded or the one he executed later. So in, in general, you don't record a will because people could see it then. Anybody could, could down, go down to the courthouse and pull up your will and see what it says. And, and uh, uh, a will is confidential until your death. So that's why you wouldn't want to record a will. You could record would, you, would you record like powers of attorney? Is that or no? Is that done by the attorney? That's a good question. It doesn't. If you record a power of attorney, it doesn't make it any more legal than it already was. But it might give some 22 year old bank manager the impression that it's more legal because it has a stamp on it that says judge of probate. So, you know, it, it doesn't hurt to record it, but it certainly doesn't doesn't help. To record it unless you're dealing with somebody who just doesn't know what the law is. Which sure. is all. Thank it doesn't you. cost much, maybe $50 to record a power of attorney. And if it helps, why not? Um, have, have, have any of you ever been to London? Just curious. I mean, it's in London, they have one of the best subways in the world. It's called, they call it the tube. And uh, it's quiet, it's efficient, it's clean. But at every landing where you would get on or get off the tube, there's a thing on the on the landing that says mind the gap. What that means is don't stick your foot in that gap between the subway and the landing because you're going to lose it if you if you do. Uh, avoid avoid the gap is what uh, uh, mind the gap means. It's all over. Um, there's a gap in a will based plan that doesn't exist in a trust based plan, and that gap is between your death and your executor given the authority to manage your affairs. Your will appoints, um, nominates an executor. The judge appoints the executor. He doesn't have to appoint that person. Nobody has authority to do anything after your death until the judge appoints the executor. That may be a month, it may be six months. During that time, nobody can keep the house payment paid. Nobody can keep the house insured. Nobody can make your car payment. Nobody can deal with with any of your creditors, because you remember the power of attorney terminates at your death and the executor's power doesn't begin until they've been appointed. That gap can cause all kinds of problems. Uh, with a revocable living trust though, there is no gap. Your power as trustee is immediate. And if you, as the original trustee, lose that authority because you've developed dementia, your successor trustee's power begins immediately. So your death really has no impact at all on your trustee's authority to manage your affairs for you after your death. That kind of leads into Barbara Powell's question, which is, um, since all POAs are durable now, if a person had been diagnosed with dementia or worse, would you have to get a medical statement if that person tried to revoke your POA? Yeah, that's... Uh... That is a weakness in the law because you have to have legal capacity to execute a will, a power of attorney, even healthcare documents. But you don't have to have legal capacity to revoke them, which doesn't make sense to me. You know, you think that revoking a, a, a will or revoking a power of attorney would require the same amount of capacity as executing one, but apparently the court disagrees with me. You can revoke a power of attorney even if you have, you know, you've been diagnosed with, you know, stage four Alzheimer's. Um, would you need then a conservatorship and guardianship in place? Yeah, what we do in our powers of attorney is we have a provision that says, if a court ever determined I needed a guardian or conservator, I hereby nominate the people serving as my agent in this power of attorney to be that guardian and conservator. So the theory there is if somebody were to revoke it because that now they've been diagnosed with dementia, 
you can immediately institute the conservatorship process to become their conservator. And that way you have all of the authority and more that you would have had as agent under the power of attorney. It just it takes a little time to get those put in place. We have more questions. Uh, Ms. Vaughn says, Yashandra Vaughn says, who should have a copy of my RLT besides myself and my lawyer? I think whoever you name as your successor trustee, uh, whether it's a sibling or a child, having a copy of that is certainly to their benefit because sooner or later they may be called upon to act as trustee and they might want to know what, what's involved, what's, what does the job entail. Um, I don't think necessarily your beneficiaries need to know uh, their beneficiaries. The trustee's job is to alert them of that if and when the time comes. Um, but uh, bankers, if you have a banker, if you have a stockbroker, financial advisor, they're always good people to give copies to as well. And then Gail Thrasher asked a question. I think you kind of answered in a way, if you made your will with an attorney when you lived in another state, should you have an Alabama attorney check over it? I don't think having it reviewed would, would pose a problem at all. Wills are valid in all 50 states. Uh, so if, even if, if you executed a will in Louisiana, which is the weirdest state in the, in the union, it would be valid in Alabama if it were valid in Louisiana when it was executed. So a will crosses state lines pretty easily, uh, but it never hurts to review because sometimes you might say, for example, I hereby leave my house located at 123 Main Street, Chicago, Illinois, to my children, 50-50. And well, you've sold that house in Chicago. Now you've moved to Birmingham and you have a house at 456 Main Street, Birmingham, Alabama. Well, the kids don't get 456 Main Street, Birmingham because the will specifically referred to a house in Chicago. So that may be something you need to change, you know, to say, I, I leave my house wherever I might live at the time of my death to my children equally. Also, you have to, with wills, you have to be careful about children, you know, especially with guys. Women, pretty much, they know if they have children, um, but a guy could have a child and never find out um, that he fathered a child. But that child is his child, just like his child of his marriage for his children. And they would have an equal say so over his estate if the will said, I leave everything to my children equally. He may not even want to include this. So he may want to say something like, I, these are my children, you know, these three. And, no, and nobody else is considered a child of mine unless. They're named specifically in this will, for example. Those are little details that you can work through when you get to see somebody else's will. Teresa Carpenter has asked, would a revocable living trust be recommended for a very modest estate? Or is it only useful and financially feasible for large sums and real estate holdings? Sure. It's a great question. A lot of people think a trust is, is uh, necessary above a certain dollar figure. Really, a trust benefits you if you have a modest estate, but you might own real estate in more than one state. You know, you might have a, a, an interest in a beach house or a house in the mountains, or you may have inher inherited some property from your folks back in Texas. Um, if you have real estate in two states, you have to go through probate in both states at death with a will. But with a trust, you avoid probate in all the states where you might own real estate at your death. So whether you own real estate outside of Alabama, it would certainly be a huge factor in, in going the trust direction. Another is some people are real sensitive to everybody knowing their business. Well, a will is a public record. Anybody and everybody can go down there and see what you're giving people, giving your kids, what your kids are going to inherit and when. With a trust, nobody gets to know that. It's com completely confidential. In smaller counties, you know, people are nosy. You know, they're like, look at your will and see what you're leaving. Uh, so a trust might be a better way to go there as well. That's a great idea, uh, Bill, because I so often talk with clients about needing to do some trust work for Medicaid preparation or VA aid in attendance. And, and, and they sort of have that belief that, oh, I don't want people knowing my business. But the opposite, according to what you just said, is actually true. It's able they're able to keep their business private through a trust 
versus having a will which exposes them. Nobody gets to see a trust, but the beneficiaries of that trust and the trustee, that's it. Uh, no third party. So it is much more confidential, it flies under the radar. Now, one area that I want to hammer on here before we, we conclude our, our, our webinar is second marriage planning, because the divorce rate in Alabama, in fact, the country is declining in all age brackets, except those people over 65. Odd, right? Younger people aren't getting married as often as they used to, so there's no divorce there, and people are staying married longer than they ever have, except the people over 65, and I think part of that is because people are living longer, they're healthier, Women are less uh, reliant on their husband's income than they were maybe in previous generations. So they have their own assets, their own income to, to uh, rely on. And I think it's become more maybe acceptable for people to say, do I really want to live the last 20 years of my life with this so-and-so? You know, I'm not getting what I need. I get my needs met. I've got only a certain amount of time to, to pursue that. So I'm, I'm, I'm going for it. Whatever the reason is, people who are older are now getting divorced more often. Uh, that means people are getting remarried. They're meeting up with other people in similar situations, whether they're widowed or they're divorced. They're meeting people in independent living facilities and marrying. Now, when you enter marriage in your 20s, you're coming in pretty much dead broke. You don't have kids. Uh, it's not a big deal. But when you get married at, say, age 70, you're bringing in possibly real estate, you're bringing in IRAs or 401ks, you're bringing in kids from your previous marriage. That makes things a lot more complicated. Now, the lovebirds, they don't see it that way. They just see somebody they're finally in love with and everything's going to be fine and all the kids are going to get along like one big family. And I can guarantee you, nothing could be further from the truth. You know, your respective kids might not trust that new person. They don't trust their motivations or they might... Uh, not like the way they're treated. Uh, they might not like all of a sudden becoming second fiddle to somebody. I mean, they've known mom their whole life. And now this guy who's only known her a year gets to make medical and financial decisions over you, which doesn't seem fair. And lastly, depending on who dies first and how much time goes by between the first death and the second death, the, the children from the first to die might be completely alienated from what's left in the, the couple, in the couple's name. So they might not even know when the second person dies. And so they're left out. So anyway, my point is there are a lot of factors going into second marriage planning that aren't there in first marriage planning. And if you know somebody who's in a second marriage or thinking about a second marriage, please encourage them to contact a lawyer to talk through all the ifs and ands there, because it is a lot more complicated. Uh, a prenup, for example, is a great way to, to deal with some of the uh, issues, financial issues anyway, of marriage. But a prenup, oddly, offers no Medicaid protection. So just think about that, too. If a, a couple who are, you know, say they're 75 years old and they get married, but they're smart enough to get a prenup that says, if we get divorced or I die or on death, my stuff goes to my family, your stuff goes to your family, and that's it. They think that if one of them goes into a nursing home, the spouse who's at home called the community spouse doesn't have to worry. Their assets will be protected because of that prenup, right? Wrong. Medicaid considers all the assets as available assets, regardless of what a prenup says, which comes as a shock to everybody who learns that. Now, you can protect assets from Medicaid, but you have to use a certain kind of trust that Sean referred to a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust because a prenup won't do it. So that pretty much takes up our time. That takes up uh, as much as I can cover in an hour anyway. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. My numbers here, our website's here. We have a pretty good blog, a lot of information, not on just estate planning, but trust work, Medicaid, VA benefits, all the stuff we work with. Um, and we're, I'm happy to answer any questions if you want to email me too. One thing, Bill, I'd like you to do, if you will, is uh, repeat your office number the full office number with the area code is today's password for our evaluation. Sure. It's uh, the area code 205. The number is 390-0101. 390-0101. that's just it. No dashes, y'all. It's 205-390-0101 straight. Thank you so much, those of you who asked questions today. I really made it engaging and 
And I feel like when you when you participate, we get to go deeper into topics then then we may know that we can go because of you know the expertise and excellence of your questions and comments. And so we thank you. Thank you, Bill, so much for doing this for us again. I know we always uh, are increase our knowledge base and are blessed by by your experience and expertise. And we work with you. We do work with Lynn Campisi and Ann Moses and John Holloman and many other attorneys. But Bill, uh, one of the things you all should know about Bill is if you call that number, 205-390-0101, which is the password, Bill will talk with you for half an hour and not charge you $250. And that's one of the things that I like so much about Bill is he's accessible. And it seems to me to be clearly having done it 40 years of mission for him. And Gail has a question, so I'll, I'll stop. Gail Thrasher, Bill asks, is there a certain price range for a revocable living trust? I assume that means to create one. Um, I don't know what other lawyers charge. Um, we charge, I think, $3,600 for the entire package. That includes the trust documents, the supporting documents like deeds, transfer documents for IRAs, 401ks, life insurance, uh, personal property. Uh, it includes a certification of trust, which is a Reader's Digest condensed version of your big trust document. It includes a will, power of attorney, all the healthcare documents. It includes um, instructions for your trustee to know how to be a trustee and uh, support. So anytime you have a question down the road, call us and say, I took over for mom as trustee and I don't know what I'm doing. What can I do? And we sit down with you and go over the process and there's no charge for that either. Um, so 36 is what we charge, 3,600. Other lawyers may charge more, may charge less. I don't know. Probably should call up and ask. Well, the, generally, Bill, what I've found is it's a six to $8,000. Oh, we need to raise our prices then. Good. I've you. told you that before, I think, many years ago. <laughs> but I'm glad you've got your prices where you are because it means that people can use you and what you have and can do for them, people well, need. You know, when you think about a will-based plan, I think we charge $1,100 for a couple for everything. You add that to the cost of probate, which is going to be $4,000 now, and you're up to $5,100. With a trust at $3,600, it does seem more expensive on the front end, but it's cheaper in the long run because you've avoided the probate process. Another great point. Well, does anyone else have some questions? Gail and, and the others have been so... Uh... So talkative, maybe some other folks have questions. And if not, I'll read to you the survey evaluation one last time. It's HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www.surveymonkey.com forward slash lowercase r forward slash all uppercase letters S W. P is in Pam, three, J is in Julie, V as in victory, seven, and the password is Bill's office number, no dashes, 205-390-0101. Thank you all so much. Oh, LaShawn Devon has a question. How often should I? Uh-oh. I don't know if I did something or you did, but I got, you got muted there, Sean. Thank your pardon. How, uh, LaShondra Vaughn is asking, how often should I review my trust with an attorney? I think uh, it depends on your life situation. You know, having kids, losing family members, uh, uh, changing locations. Uh, in general, every five years is a good you know, rule of thumb. Um, but if, if, if you have children or you have your children develop special needs because of an accident, you might want to review it sooner than that. Thank you, Bill. You bet. I've enjoyed it. Thanks. I've enjoyed having you. It's so good to have you. It seems like you're here a good bit and you're so kind to do it for free. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Always fun to, to tell people a little bit about what we do for a living. Isn't it fun? I love doing these things and I, I love you for being here and I'm going to let everybody go for the day. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your week and join us Friday when our own CW Merritt presents uh, It's Raining Dementia. So it's a new take on the umbrella term of dementia and is covering many, many conditions. 
Y'all join us Friday. Thank you again, Bill. Y'all have a great week.